I am convinced that mathematical computation has a great part to play in the future and that its contribution will fully live up to the expectations of the great pioneers of the computer revolution. Hi, my name is Eric Normand, and you just heard a quote from Jim Wilkinson's 1970 Turing Award lecture. Full name is James Hardy Wilkinson. He was born in 1919 in England. And his biography, you know, on the Turing Award page, they often show, uh, they often have a, a really nice biography. This one happens to be really good because I think they recognized that a lot of people who would be interested in listening to the Turing Award would not be that familiar with the numerical analysis, the linear algebra, the matrix stuff that he worked on. Uh, and so it has a good amount of information and I'm going to read a lot from it today. Um, it really shows the significance that um, this, uh, the importance of this numerical analysis that uh, we take for granted today because I think they did such a good job, just like you can use a computer uh, without really worrying about the hardware failing on you. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the hardware engineers have done such a good job you just don't think about all the work they've done. Uh, likewise, I think with um, floating point numbers and um, mathematical applications, uh, we don't think about the error that is introduced. So let's, let's read from the bio before we get into his Turing Award lecture. James, known as Jim, Hardy Wilkinson was a British mathematician who became the leading expert in a new and important field that emerged after World War II. It goes under two names, matrix computations and numerical linear algebra. He worked with Alan Turing uh, at the National, Physics, uh, National Physical Laboratory. Um, all right, now I'm going to read from, so the commentator in this biogra biography is taking a lot of liberties to explain the importance of his work. So, um, people are awed at the prodigious speeds at which computers execute primitive arithmetic operations such as addition and multiplication, yet this speed is achieved at a price. Almost every answer is wrong. It is not due to difficulties in approximation. It is due to an iron law. All numbers used in a computer shall have a fixed number of digits. Okay, so normally in, in math, you know, before you had numerical computing machines, uh, you would solve problems um, exactly, right? You could say, oh, square root of two. And the square root of two, you would just leave it symbolically as the square root of two, even though it's an irrational number, you'd never be able to write all the digits. Now that forms an approximation when you have to find a fixed number of digits. He's saying it's not the approximation, it's that when you multiply two numbers, well, we'll get to that. So this is what the error comes from. The numbers we are talking about are usually floating point numbers that have two parts, a fraction and an exponent. It is the fractional parts with which we are concerned here. Consider them as restricted to 16 digits. The product of two 16 digit fractions needs 32 digits to represent it. And the computer always throws away the last 16 of them. The relative error is minuscule. For calculations involving physical quantities such as pressure or velocity, the given precision is usually adequate, but in applications such as astronomy, it may not be. So consider 
uh, you have to get the uh, angle perfect, you know, to, to adjust your telescope, to aim at a particular star, and you you know, you do all these calculations, and even just the tiniest angle off, you will miss the star, right? That's, that's what they're talking about. Okay. Wilkinson pioneered successful error analyses of all the matrix algorithms of his day. Okay, more on that later. He will get back to that. Um, a host of diverse scientific and engineering problems boil down to solving a few standard matrix problems. Direct methods for solving A times X equals B had been refined for humans with handheld computing devices since the 1930s, and it did not seem too much of a challenge to automate these methods. The only cloud on the horizon was the threat of all those round-off errors. Might they undermine the hopes inspired by the new devices? Mathematicians of the greatest power, uh, for example, John von Neumann and Alan Turing, thought hard about these problems. So he talks about, you know, okay, I'll, I'll read it. Remember that no human being had ever solved 50 equations in 50 unknowns by a direct method. So we never had to do that before. And now that a computer has the power, you know, the patience, <laughs> the time, uh, to uh, the speed to, to solve such large systems, um, we don't know what's going to happen. Wilkinson had one great advantage over von Neumann and Turing. He had been obliged to solve 18 equations in 18 unknowns with a hand-cranked mechanical calculator during World War II. He had seen how amazingly accurate the direct method was. The ar that arduous exercise helped Wilkinson think in a different way from these other experts in accounting for those troublesome round-off errors. Stop obsessing over how large the error in the final output might be and ask instead how little could the data be changed so that the output is exactly correct? This is the fruitful question. Okay, so this, this might take a little bit of explaining, but I have to read a little bit more for context, and then we can talk about it. Wilkinson won the Turing Prize for showing that the fears of the experts were unfounded, for understanding precisely the role of round-off error in matrix computations, and for showing a way to make it all look rather easy. His tool was the so-called backward error analysis. Instead of concentrating on the size of the error, find the problem which the computed solution solved exactly. Okay, so he is looking for how far from the real problem are we? So like, imagine you had a matrix full of, of approximations so you're already you already have an error like an error bound on these numbers we're saying it's 10.25763 but you know plus or minus one percent right so you do this calculation and you you come up with a number that has more error because you've now done all these rounding errors because you didn't have enough digits to store all the digits you needed. There's some error in that. So you take that answer with the error and you say, well, what matrix multiplication would have given me that answer? And then how different is that, you know, a different question, <laughs> right? This different matrix that resulted in this answer. How different is that matrix from the one I started with? And if it's within the error, or you know, the approximation error bounds, it's, it's probably fine, right? Okay, so he's going to formalize that like this. For the A times X equals B problem, let the computer output be Z. So the answer is, is Z as a solution for X, right? You're solving for X. The answer is Z. Look for a small matrix E and a small vector, so small matrix big E, capital E, and a small vector little E, such that 
a plus e times z equals b plus e. Right, so instead of x, now you're using the z, the new answer, the actual answer you got. And instead of a, you're doing a plus e. So a plus a difference and it equals b plus e. So b plus a difference. If the bounds on e and big E and little e are really tiny, should we not be satisfied? After all, the entries in A and B may well be uncertain. If the error is still large, then the problem itself, that is, the pair AB, must be close to being ill-posed. So, uh, this was written by Beresford Neil Parlett. Um, I suggest you read it. It's, it's really interesting how he breaks it down. And uh, there's a lot more I didn't read. I read about, you know, 10% of it, maybe, maybe less, uh, you know, out loud here as an excerpt. So if you haven't heard one of my episodes where I read these Turing Award um, lectures, I'll give you a little, little intro. So I'm reading lectures from the Turing Award. Prob I'm probably going to do them in order. Uh, I often read some stuff from the bio that will give context later. Um, if you go to the ACM page for each Turing Award laureate, they have a little bio. Talks about biographical details, where they were born, uh, where they got their education, and then sometimes a little bit more about uh, you know their history, where they where they they got their chops and what what problem they were solving. And then I read from an excerpt from the Turing lecture itself. Um, this one is 1970. Uh, it seems like they were not recorded and released publicly uh, and, and in video. Uh, eventually, you can start watching the lectures on YouTube. Uh, but these are all, you know, edited and published in the um, journal of the ACM, usually about, you know, the next year. So it was given in 1970, but then published in 1971. This one uh, was very troubling for me. Uh, it's different from the other lectures. It's much less technical. And it's also a field that I'm not uh, that familiar with. It's very humorous, and the style is very, um, I guess, flowing. You know, he, he, the biography talks about him being a good, like, conversational style orator. And so I'm used to finding, you know, a sentence or two that really sums up the point that they're trying to make. And this one was really hard to do that because... I kept finding these points that were spread out over sentences, and then he never like just hits it on the head. Uh, it's a very good read, and another cool thing about it is he actually worked with Turing, Alan Turing, uh, for a number of years, uh, worked closely with him, and so there's a lot of stories in here about Alan Turing, which I... I, I found really cool. Uh, I also try to analyze these for like kind of historical context, just to get an idea of what the field was like. And of course, you get an idea of what the field was like in 1970, because this was given in 1970. So anything he says in the present tense, you can get some context from. But he also talks about what it was like back in the 30s and 40s, which I find pretty cool as well. So he was born in 1919. Uh, so very early in the history of computing. Um, I think that, that these early Turing Award lectures were by people who were born like in the, in the teens or the 20s. And uh, that's pretty cool that these were captured. It's very important to understand the history of our field. And it's not that much history. It's so such a young field. 
Okay, so let me start reading. The name of it is Some Comments from a Numerical Analyst by J. H. Wilkinson. From 1946 to 1948, I had the privilege of working with the great man himself, that's Alan Turing, at the National Physical Laboratory. I use the term great man advisedly because he was indeed a remarkable genius. That's really nice. From 1946 to 1948, a few years there. Um, and he calls him a genius. Now, I also have to say that at this time, in 1970, the work that Turing did at Bletchley Park was still classified. So people knew he had done a lot of stuff in the war, uh, but they, he couldn't publish about it, and he couldn't talk about it. So uh, the, his accomplishments with the Enigma machine and stuff were still unknown, even by his close associates. I was of military age when the war broke out, and being by nature a patriotic man, I felt that I could serve my country more effectively, and incidentally, a lot more comfortably, working in the government scientific service than serving as an incompetent infantryman. The British government took a surprisingly enlightened attitude on the subject, and almost from the start of the war, those with scientific qualifications were encouraged to take this course. So, um, just some historical context. I've heard from many sources that the, the powers that be at the time, the, the um, governments, uh, were, were very scientific at this time, uh, meaning that they recognized that the war would be won largely on who had better technology. Um, this was coming soon after, um, after World War I, where technology also played a decisive factor, but it was learned kind of slowly. And so by, um, by World War II, I think they recognized that we got to get started as early as possible. And if some you know, someone with a degree in science doesn't want to, you know, hold a gun. Uh, we'll just put them in a, in a lab and have them, you know, run numbers and, and invent things. I therefore spent the war in the armament research department working mainly on such fascinating topics as external ballistics, fragmentation of bombs and shells, and the thermodynamics of explosives. My task was to solve problems of a mathematical nature arising in these fields using computational methods if necessary. Okay, so he's solving these kind of physics problems that are very mathematical, a lot of calculation. Maybe they have to use some computation. Gradually, I became interested in the numerical solution of physical problems. Okay. In 1946, I joined the newly formed Mathematics Division at the National Physical Laboratory. It was there that I first met Alan Turing. Uh, so this is after the end of the war. Um, he was not able to be released immediately. Uh, so he uh, joined this Mathematical Division at the National Physical Laboratory. Uh, it was there that I first met Alan Turing. I was to spend half my time in the computing section, that is, you know, in another place beside, without Alan Turing, and the other half with Alan Turing. For several months, Alan and I worked together in a remarkably small room at the top of an old house, which had been taken over temporarily by NPL to house mathematics division. So he's working closely in this small room. My task was to assist Turing in the logical design of the computer ACE, A-C-E, which was to be built at NPL, that's a National Physical Laboratory, and to consider the problems of programming some of the more basic algorithms of numerical analysis. 
Now, I mean, I just imagine this, like what if you, what if I was in a room with Alan Turing, uh, given this assignment of designing a computer with him? Uh, of course, there hadn't been many computers designed at that point. So a lot of this is unknown territory. So you're kind of making up a lot, learning all you can from the other computers and, you know, slowly, uh, slowly come, making something come together. I, I, I mean, the opportunity sounds really amazing, but I, I would have a lot of uh, uh, anxiety about it. My work in the competing section was intended to broaden my knowledge of that subject. See, so he was working in both um, Turing's lab and in this computing section that was helping him understand the, the field. Working with Turing was tremendously stimulating, perhaps at times to the point of exhaustion. It was impossible to work half-time for a man like Turing, and almost from the start, the periods spent with the computing section were rather brief. I can imagine... Turing had a strong predilection for working things out from first principles, usually in the first instance without consulting any previous work on the subject, and no doubt it was this habit which gave his work that characteristically original flavor. It's really interesting. Um, we, I, I, did not, I did not know that. I mean, it kind of makes sense when I read it. Uh, but it's really fascinating to, to hear this uh, firsthand, someone observing Turing firsthand and, and telling it to us because by this time he was already dead and um, sadly. And so he, you know, didn't have much, um, he didn't leave much of this kind of legacy, this kind of like how do you work legacy behind. Uh, so it's nice to see this documented somewhere. As you know, his life was rather tragically ended um, too early. Okay. Turing carried this to extreme lengths, and I must confess that at first I found it rather irritating. This referring to how he would work from first principles. He would set me a piece of work, and when I had completed it, he would not deign to look at my solution, but would embark on the problem himself. Only after having a preliminary trial on his own was he prepared to read my work. I soon came to see the advantage of his approach. In the first place, he was really not as quick at grasping other people's ideas as he was at formulating his own. But what is more important he would frequently come up with some original approach which had escaped me and might well have eluded him had he read my account immediately. I mean, it's just fun to hear how great minds work, right? Um, I think it's, it's actually pretty cool to see something like this very practical. And it makes me think I should try that uh, next time I ask someone to solve a problem for me. And when they're done, I'll solve it myself without looking at their solution. And then once I'm done, I can, I can look at their solution and we can compare. Okay. When he finally got round to reading my own work, he was generally very appreciative. He was particularly fond of little programming tricks. Some would say that he was too fond of them to be a good programmer. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. He liked little clever things. Uh, and I think uh, another, another Turing Award lecture talked about that. Um, yeah, it's Maurice Wilkes. I think he talked about that, about him being too enamored with these little clever tricks. Excuse me. Okay, here's another thing. And you really should read this yourself. Let me, let me just say that. Uh, I can't possibly read it all, um, even though I'm going to read. <laughs> I'm looking at my highlights. I'm going to read quite a bit of it because it is discursive. Um, 
I think you should read it, get the flavor for it, and uh, you, you'll probably get more humor out if you read it yourself. It's very, it's very nice humor. Had it not been for Turing, I would probably have become just a pure mathematician. Of course, he means pure mathematician pejoratively. Turing's reputation is now so well established that it scarcely stands in need of a boost from me. Okay, so this is, a, this is one of those little clues that if you're reading something from a historical perspective, like what can I learn about the history? We, we can see that in 1970, Turing's reputation was already well established. Um, and, you know, I appreciate that. I didn't know that. Uh, you know, there, we talk about him a lot today. Um, and when I was in university, he was mentioned quite a lot. Um, but you never know, like, how, how much uh, in the past they were, they appreciated his work, especially since the stuff didn't come out until later in the 70s uh, about his work there in the um in Bletchley Park I feel bound to say that his published work fails to give an adequate impression of his remarkable versatility as a mathematician his knowledge ranged widely over the whole field of pure and applied mathematics and seemed not merely something he had learned from books but to form an integral part of the man himself in spite of this, he had only 20 published papers to his credit, written over a period of some 20 years. Remarkable as some of these papers are, this work represents a mere fraction of what he might have done if things had turned out just a little differently. So he, he just didn't have that much output. He was not, he, he, he didn't publish that much. He had a big effect with the papers he did publish and probably on the people that he worked with, uh, but that's a shame. And then I, I, when I first read it, this, this phrase, if things had turned out just a little differently, I really read that as if he hadn't been convicted of homosexuality and chemically castrated and uh and died tragically from poisoning at an early age that's what i read that as uh but and you know and that maybe in 1970 they were still afraid to talk about that um but that's not really what he means. He, he's talking about his whole life, and uh, that's just an ambiguous phrase about, about three things that he's about to talk about. So if you felt that too, just wait a second before judging this. In the first place, there were si the six years starting from 1939, which he spent at the Foreign Office. He was 27 in 1939, so that in different circumstances, this period might well have been the most productive of his life. So this is during the war. Um, this is the classified work that he did that he could not publish on uh, and even really talk about. And it wasn't declassified until the mid-1970s. Uh, and even, I think, just a few years ago, they published some of his like memos that he had circulated at the office that were still classified or it just hadn't been you know unearthed or whatever um so this stuff is still coming out and um it's kind of a shame like they even say that the offices at bletchley park because no one really knew because it was all classified they just let them decay and um then in the 70s it was kind of they were kind of beyond repair um by the time that they were like well this these buildings are important we should keep them um 
Okay, but um, this is the kind of thing that he's talking about. Like in different circumstances, you know, if things had turned out differently, this would have been the most productive of his life. He seemed not to have regretted the years he spent there, and indeed we form the impression that this was one of the happiest times of his life. Turing simply loved problems and puzzles of all kinds, and the problems he encountered there must have given him a good deal of fun. Certainly it was there that he gained his knowledge of electronics, and this was probably the decisive factor in his deciding to go to NPL to design an electronic computer rather than returning to Cambridge. So people are just kind of gleaning information. This must have been where he got his, you know, his idea of electronics and making a computer, but they didn't know what he was doing there. A second factor limiting his output was a marked disinclination to put pen to paper. He just didn't like to write. 20 papers, 20 years, about a paper per year. While I was preparing this talk, an early mathematics division report was unearthed. It was written by Turing in 1946. Its main purpose was to convince the committee of the feasibility and importance of building an electronic computer. So this is in, you know, probably 1970. They found this, um, this uh, report from 1946 about building the computer. Now this is the time when Wilkinson was working with him. It is full of characteristic touches of humor and rereading it for the first time for perhaps 24 years, I was struck once again by his remarkable originality and versatility. As early as 1946, Turing had considered the possibility of working with both interval and significant digit arithmetic and the report recalled forgotten conversations, not to mention heated arguments, which we had on this topic. I think that's so cool that he got to relive this experience a little bit by find, when he found this paper. And he was saying that Turing was, you know, kind of ahead, uh, that it was, he was very early in this work. Turing's international reputation rests mainly on his work on computable numbers, but I like to recall that he was a considerable numerical analyst, and a good part of his time from 1946 onwards, was spent working in this field. While at NPL, he wrote a remarkable paper on the error analysis of matrix computations. Okay. So now we're in a section, it's kind of, he's ending this touring section. It's called The Present State of Numerical Analysis. Numerical analysis is unique among the various topics which comprise the rather ill-defined discipline of computer science. I would be very sorry to see numerical analysis sever all its connections with computer science. Numerical analysis is clearly different from the other topics in having had a long and distinguished history. Only the name is new. It appears not to have been used before the 50s. Okay, so he's, I think this is really interesting because um, even in the 70s, it seemed like there wasn't, just by the way he's talking about it, it seemed like there wasn't really an appreciation of numerical analysis of this, you know, error uh, figuring, you know, analyzing the errors of computations and how to deal with that. Uh, it doesn't seem like people were that interested in it at the time, even though it was kind of foundational. Um, but he does want it to be part of computer science. He doesn't think that it belongs, say, in, in math. Some like to trace its history back to the Babylonians. Certainly many of the giants of the mathematical world, including both the great Newton and Gauss themselves, devoted a substantial part of their research to computational problems. Many of the leaders of the computer revolution thought in terms of developing a tool which was specifically intended for the solution of problems arising in physics and engineering. 
This was certainly true of the two men of genius, von Neumann and Turing. Turing regarded such applications as the main justification for embarking on what was, even then, a comparatively expensive undertaking. A high percentage of the leading lights of the newly formed computer societies were primarical, primarily numerical analysts, and the editorial boards of the new journals were drawn largely from their ranks. So computing had changed quite a bit since this time in the in the 40s um, up to 1970 because apparently numerical analysis was one of the main topics back then um, but I have to imagine that they did such a good job that we just take it for granted like they've just kind of slowly improved it but it solved well enough um, I mean, I find that really interesting. And uh, maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but, you know, matrix multiplication is really important now in neural networks. So it could be that these things are, you know, getting more attention now. I'm not, I'm not up on the research there. The use of electronic computers brought with it a new crop of problems, all perhaps loosely associated with programming, and quite soon a whole field of new endeavors grew up around the computer. So new endeavors meaning endeavors besides these physics and engineering problems uh, that you're trying to solve with the computer. So he's talking about programming, programming languages, parsing, Many people who set out originally to solve some problem in mathematical physics found themselves temporarily deflected by the problems of computerology. That's what he calls everything besides numerical analysis. Deflected by the problems of computerology, and we are still waiting with bated breath for the epic-making contributions they will surely make when they return to the fold, clothed in their superior wisdom. Well, he's obviously being facetious here. Um, but he's saying that a lot of people were deflected. Um, they were distracted by the problems that, the new problems that arose from the computer and programming and things like that, and they weren't solving their physics problems anymore. Um, and they're probably not coming back. In contrast to numerical analysis, the problems of computerology are entirely new. Right? So um, he did say that you could trace things back to the Babylonians in numerical analysis. I think he's saying it's kind of a stretch to do that, but you could if you tried um, because they had systematic computation back then. But then once the computer was invented, there's like this whole new field. That's not just how do we apply this to big, you know, number crunching problems. The whole science is characterized by restless activity and excitement, and completely new topics are constantly springing up. When I read this, I thought about, I just had to say, I thought about um, the JavaScript churn, the framework churn, um, the fatigue of all the different constantly new uh, inventions that aren't really inventions, but they're new topics, new things to talk about. And this, this restless activity and excitement over every new thing. Um, also reminded of a quote by Alan Kay, who says that programming is a pop, a pop, uh, what is it called? pop culture right we don't uh we don't know our history we're not doing um like a more refined culture it's pop culture it's just all about what's being talked about these days computerology has a vital part to play in ensuring that computers are fully exploited 
I'm sure that it is good for numerical analysts to be associated with a group of people who are so much alive and full of enthusiasm. I'm equally sure that there is merit in computer science embracing a subject like numerical analysis, which has a solid background of past achievement. Inevitably, though, numerical analysis has begun to look a little square in the computer science setting, and numerical analysts are beginning to show signs of losing faith in themselves. Their sense of isolation is accentuated by the present trend toward abstraction in mathematics departments, which makes for an uneasy relationship. Um, so he's kind of hedging a bit. He's saying like, ah, oh, you know, excitement is good. Enthusiasm is good. But compared to that stuff, numerical analysis looks slow and unexciting. And uh, they feel even more isolated because math departments are not talking about the practical computation side anymore. They're talking about abstract math now. <sighs> Must be tough. Uh, there is a silver lining. He does talk about some good stuff in a minute, so just hold on. There is a second question which is asked with increasing frequency. What's new in numerical analysis? This is invariably delivered in such a manner as to leave no doubt that the questioner's answer is nothing. Of course, everything in computerology is new. That is at once its attraction and its weakness. Only recently I learned that computers are revolutionizing astrology. Horoscopes by computer. It's certainly never been done before, and I understand that it is very remunerative. Seriously, though, it was not to be expected that numerical an analysis would be turned upside down in the course of a decade or two. Okay, so um, people notice that numerical analysis is slower than the other parts of computer science. And again, like my own personal experience is with some, like the language closure. Um, Closure takes a very slow, plodding, methodical approach to change. And so people don't hear about it because there's nothing new to announce. The language is not new. Nothing has changed. We haven't, you know, deprecated half of the language and made a new half uh, to modernize it. It is very it's it changes very slowly in the last five years not much has happened and the people who use it think well that's a good thing my code from even 10 years ago can still run meanwhile everyone thinks it's dead because it's not getting on hacker news or something and um javascript has new frameworks all the time and they're all kind of rehashing the same ideas, but in different configurations. And, uh, you know, there hasn't been anything new really since React, I think. And it just seems, it seems like turn for turn's sake and people are excited about nothing from the outside. Uh, but it's active. It's alive. You know, people are investing in it and people are learning it because... They want to get in on the new stuff. Uh, so you see this contrast between the, oh, let's say the difficulty of learning classical music versus the ease of picking up a few chords on a guitar and playing some rock music. Um, Classical music is hard, uh, not because it's trying to be hard, <laughs> but because it's deep. There's been a lot of, uh, there's a lot to learn, and it requires a lot of skill, and uh, it just takes a lot more effort to to get into it. And so it's not 
it's not surprising that it doesn't, um, it's not as exciting, right? Okay. Over the last 300 years, some of the finest intellects in the mathematical world have been brought to bear on the problems we are trying to solve. It is not surprising that our rate of progress cannot quite match the heady pace, which is so characteristic of computerology. While I was preparing this lecture, I made a brief review of what has been achieved since 1950 and found it surprisingly impressive. Okay, so that's actually cool uh, that in 20 years, you know, you, you look back over this long span and you can put together quite a nice list of achievements. Uh, and I wonder, likewise, if we looked at something like the progress of JavaScript, you know, JavaScript development, um, if you wouldn't have a kind of, you know, despite all the new stuff coming up all the time, like the major points would be, you know, when you look back over 20 years, the major points would just be kind of the big things and, and the other stuff, you've forgotten about them. Um, so they would look very similar, maybe. Right, so this is, um, this is him looking back from 1950, and this is in 1970. We are fortunate here in having, in the little book written by V. N. Fadiva, an admirably concise and accurate account of the situation as it was in 1950. A substantial part of the book is devoted to the solution of the eigenvalue problem, and scarcely any of the methods discussed there are in use today. In fact, as far as non-Hermitian ma uh, matrices are concerned, even the methods which, ad which were advocated at the 1957 Wayne Matrix Conference have been almost completely superseded. Using a modern version of the QR algorithm, one can expect to produce an accurate eigensystem of a dense matrix of order 100 in a time which is of the order of a minute. Okay, so at the, oh, at the 1957 Wayne Conference, we did not appear to be within hailing distance of such an achievement. So he's talking about two different points in time, 1950, this book, um, that the book showed the, the, state of the art at the time and in 1970 you wouldn't do that the state of the art has progressed so much that you wouldn't use any of it anymore and then another point in time 13 years prior in 1957 um that it was at a conference that uh, the methods were almost completely superseded so He's saying that like we've made a lot of progress and the field is like completely different uh, from what it was just 13 years ago. Comparable advances have been made in the development of iterative methods for solving sparse linear systems of the type arising from partial differential equations. Okay, so that's cool. You know, you look back 20 years and you have made a lot of progress. Maybe it's not as, you know, exciting. Maybe it's just the nature of, you know, matrix multiplication. It just doesn't seem that, that fun. Uh, okay. When I joined NPL in 1946, the mood of pessimism about the stability of elimination methods for solving linear systems was at its height and was a major talking point. Bounds had been produced, which purported to show that the error in the solution would be proportional to four to the nth power, and this suggested that it would be impractical to solve systems even of quite modest order. I think it was true to say that at that time, in 1946, 
It was the more distinguished mathematicians who were most pessimistic, the less gifted being perhaps unable to appreciate the full severity of the difficulties. So he's going back and talking about his, the, the, his, his contribution and um, how revolutionary it was compared to what even the greatest minds were doing at that time. People thought that this was an impossible problem, uh, that this was, a, you know, one of those, you know, kind of halting problem kind of things where it's like, we'll never know if a program is going to stop. And um, if, you, if you looked at this and you saw that, wow, the error is proportional to four to the n. So the more unknowns you have in your problem, uh, you know, that's, that's quite a large, uh, yeah, every unknown you add multiplies it by four. You know, that's a huge growth. While I was at the armament research department, I had an encounter with matrix computations, which puzzled me a good deal. After a succession of failures, I had been presented with a system of 12 linear equations to solve. I was delighted at last at being given a problem which I knew all about and had departed with my task, confident that I would return with the solution in a very short time. However, when I returned to my room, confidence rapidly evaporated. The set of 144 coefficients suddenly looked very much larger than they had seemed when I was given them. I finally decided to use Gaussian elimination with what would now be called partial pivoting. Okay, so he's given this problem. Uh, it seemed easy, but then when he sat down to start, he thought, wow, this is going to be a big deal. Anxiety about rounding errors in elimination methods had not yet reared its head, and I used 10 decimal computation, wait, 10, yeah, 10 decimal computation more as a safety precaution uh, than because I was expecting any severe instability problems. So we used 10 decimals, 10 significant digits. I slowly lost figures until the final reduced equation was of the form. And then he gives this, you know, 0.00003762235 times x, the 12th x, x sub 12 equals 0. 0.000. So he just like this, you know, random numbers, but he's showing that's kind of an example. At this stage, I can remember thinking to myself that the computed x sub 12 derived from this relation could scarcely have more than six correct figures, even supposing that there had been no buildup in rounding errors, and I contemplated computing the answers to six figures only. However, as those of you who have worked with a desk computer will know, one tends to make fewer blunders if one adheres to a, a steady pattern of work, and accordingly I computed all variables to 10 figures, though fully aware of the absurdity of doing so. Okay, so here he was thinking, all right, there's going to be a bunch of error. And even with all this error, there can't be more than six significant digits. I mean, you just look at, at these numbers. I mean, you can't look at them unless you're reading along. But there's really, there are these long decimal numbers, four leading zeros, and then six non-zero digits. Likewise on the other side of the equal sign. So you're going to you know, solve for x, and how can you have more than six significant digits if you only started with six digits on both sides? But he's going to do it to 10, just because that's what he's, he's going to fill out that whole, you know, all the digits. Then being by that time a well-trained computer, I substituted my solution in the original equations to see how they checked. Okay, so he plugged them back in to check. To my astonishment, the left-hand side agreed with the given right-hand side to 10 figures. 
That is, to the full extent of the right-hand side. That, I said to myself, was a coincidence. Eleven more coincidences followed, because remember, there are 12, um, 12 equations, so 12 unknowns. So he's doing this 11 more times. Uh, Eleven more coincidences followed, though perhaps not quite in rapid succession, because, you know, they take a long time to calculate. Okay, funny, funny. I was completely baffled by this. I felt sure that none of the variables could have more than six correct figures, and yet the agreement was as good as it would have been if I had been given the exact answer and had then rounded it to ten figures. Okay. So, somehow, uh, he had this experience of doing these large computations with matrices and found that even with all the rounding errors, it was still good to 10 digits. I don't really understand the significance of this. Um, apparently, this was the experience that let him see differently from Turing and von Neumann, that this was something uh, very important, that even if you started with six digits on both sides, they still will come out to 10 digits correctly. My taskmaster had to admit he was impressed when I claimed that I had the exact solution corresponding to a right-hand side, which differed only in the 10th figure from the given one. As you can imagine, this experience was very much in my mind when I arrived at NPL and encountered the preoccupation with the instability of elimination methods. I still believe that my computed answers had at best six correct figures, but it was puzzling that in my only encounter with linear systems, it was the surprising accuracy of the solutions which required an explanation. Hmm. So it was puzzling to him as well. Uh, I am not familiar with numerical analysis, so, you know, I'm glad he's puzzled too, or he was puzzled at the time. Makes me feel a little bit better about my myself, my own mathematical understanding. Sometime after my arrival, a system of 18 equations arrived in mathematics division, and after talking around it for some time, we finally decided to abandon theorizing and to solve it. A system of 18 is surprisingly formidable, even when one has had previous experience with 12, and we accordingly decided on a joint effort. The operation was manned by Fox, Goodwin, Turing, and me, and we decided on Gaussian elimination with complete pivoting. Okay, so they're going to solve this giant problem, and they're going to work together. History repeated itself remarkably closely. Again, the system was mildly ill-conditioned. The last equation had a coefficient of order 10 to the minus 4. And the residuals were again of order 10 to the minus 10. That is of the size corresponding to the exact solution rounded to 10 decimals. I suppose this must be regarded as a defeat for Turing, since he, at that time, was a keener adherent than any of the rest of us to the pessimistic school. However, I'm sure that this experience made quite an impression on him and set him thinking afresh on the problem of rounding errors in elimination processes. About a year later, he produced his famous paper, Rounding Off Errors in Matrix Processes, which together with the paper of John von Neumann and H. Goldstein, Goldstein did a great deal to dispel the gloom. The second round undoubtedly went to Turing. I think we can fairly claim today to have an, a reasonably complete understanding of matrix stability problems, not only in the solution of linear systems, but also in the far more difficult eigenvalue problem. Okay, well I'm glad somebody has a complete understanding because I don't. I don't really get what happened there. I mean, I get the mechanics of it, but I don't understand. I don't understand how that can lead you to a breakthrough of understanding. Except that maybe the problem wasn't as bad as they thought. Like, had they just not done enough matrix multiplications to see 
that it wasn't such, it wasn't as bad as they thought. You know, the theory sh- said four to the N, the error would be on the order of four to the N, when in fact it still worked out to 10 decimal places. I don't know. I don't know. There are other respects in which we have not been particularly successful even in this field. So he's talking about the failures in the matrix field now. Most important of these is a partial failure in communication. The use of algorithms and a general understanding of the stability problem has lagged much further behind developments than it should have. The basic problems of matrix computation have the advantage of simple formulations. And I feel that the preparation of well-tested and well-documented algorithms should have advanced side by side with their development and analysis. So they didn't, they didn't release enough, enough code. They didn't have, you know, libraries of matrix operations that were well tested and well documented. Maybe at that time you don't release a library as a, you know, a GitHub repo. You could release it as a book, have people translate it into the programming language uh, that they used at their computing site. Uh, but they didn't do it enough. They m- might have had a, a bigger impact if they had done that. There are two reasons why this has not happened. One, it is a much more arduous task than was appreciated to pre- prepare the documentation thoroughly. And two, insufficient priority has been attached to doing it. Okay, it's more difficult, and we just didn't, we didn't care about it as much. I think it is of vital importance that all the work that has been expended on the development of satisfactory algorithms should be made fully available to the people who need to use it. I would go further than this and claim that it is a social duty to see that this is achieved. Interesting. Um, I know that there is a lot of work now uh, released not you know the work has been done probably ongoing work but you know projects like numpy um those kinds of projects of like actually bringing these numerical methods into popular usage through uh libraries in um in popular po- uh, programming languages you know i think that this might be happening might have happened already A second disquieting feature about work in the matrix field is that it has tended to be isolated from that in very closely related areas. In particular, linear programming and statistical computations. Workers in linear algebra and linear programming seemed until recently to comprise almost completely disjoint sets, and this is surely undesirable. The standard computations required in practical statistics provide the most direct opportunities for applying the basic matrix algorithms, and yet there is surprisingly little collaboration. Yeah, I I can see how that would be a problem. I'm not sure about the current state, you know, right now in 2021, whether they're collaborating now. I think it is primarily the duty of people working in the matrix field to make certain that their work is used in related areas. And this calls for an aggressive policy. Okay. So it's actually common in these touring lectures that uh, it gets into opinion and um, uh, more than opinion, but kind of imperatives for the field. And so that's, that's great. You know, what is the field overlooking? Um, that's often answered in these, these touring award lectures. A third disappointing feature is the failure of numerical analysts to influence computer hardware and software in the way that they should. In the early days of the computer revolution, computer designers and numerical analysts worked closely together 
and indeed we're often the same people. Now there is a regrettable tendency for numerical analysts to opt out of any responsibility for the design of the arithmetic facilities and a failure to influence the more basic features of software. Um, that's interesting because I think there's... I'm not sure what happens at places like Intel uh, when they're when they're working on the CPUs. Um, I imagine that I imagine that this is the same problem. Um, but on GPUs, GPUs, I'm I'm sure they're talking to the numerical analysts because that's what they do, right? Especially the ones that are designed for um, for neural networks. Uh, those do matrix multiplications all day long. So this might be a vindication of that again. Um, I'm not sure, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like that, uh, that they would want to talk to these numerical analysts. Um, okay. One of the main virtues of an electronic computer from the point of view of the numerical analyst is its ability to do arithmetic fast. Need the arithmetic be so bad? Okay, that's his little last, last burst. Okay, final comments. These are the comments I read at the beginning. I am convinced that mathematical computation has a great part to play in the future and that its contribution will fully live up to the expectations of the great pioneers of the computer revolution. Okay, so that is the end. That's all I wanted to read from it. Read it yourself. Uh, there's also in the notes on my site, uh, the page for this, this episode, um, there's a link to something I found. Um, it's a, it's like a bibliography page uh, of all of his works, all of his published works, plus a lot of recorded video. Uh, so you can get a feel for the man and his style of talking. And, uh, you know, maybe if you prefer watching video or listening, there's interviews uh, and stuff like that on there to get a better idea. Maybe I haven't watched all of it, but there could be some more touring stories in there, which I would be, I'd be happy to listen to myself. So yeah. Um, thank you for listening. I'm going to see who the next touring award winner is. Excuse me while I look at this. So that was 1970. Oh, next up is John McCarthy. Yay. Okay, that'll be fun. Uh, John McCarthy is the inventor of Lisp. So I'll have a lot to say about that one. Um, I'm sorry. I have to apologize because this one, this is not my field, so I don't have that much to say about it. It was very nice learning a little bit about it. Um, through both the biography and the, the lecture itself. Uh, but I didn't have much to say. Um, not much analysis. I found it interesting. I hope you found it interesting too. I think that they're going to be like that a lot. Sometimes I am more interested in the topic and I've thought about it more. And so I have more stuff to say. And sometimes the people are not so clear. <laughs> He's very clear as well. So uh, if they're not clear and it's a topic I'm interested in, there's a lot to say because I can explain what they mean. But him being so clear and also it not being something I was familiar with, not much to say. So anyway, uh, I hope you subscribe. You can catch the next ones. And uh, I'll sign off. My name is Eric Normand. Thank you for listening, and as always, rock on.